Sup, chooms, how y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you're all having a preem week. So, in my crusade against the slaphead curse, I have had the privilege of providing some clarity to consumers who have been misled by the basement-dwelling, neck-bearded internet fear-mongerers about conventional hair loss treatments like finasteride, and it pleases me immensely knowing that my content has helped inspire so many people to take that crucial step in their struggle against hair loss. And as fantastic as finasteride and minoxidil are, the more weapons we have at our disposal to fight back against this genetic defect, the better it is for everybody. And that is why I have been doing a lot of research into upcoming treatments that seek to either further improve existing pathways for treating hair loss, such as addressing androgens on the scalp, topically such as with things like pyrolutamide, or they try to tackle hair loss from an entirely new mechanism, such as with all the Wnt pathway drugs I've talked about. Now, I have covered many of these on my channel, and I'll link them below for those who are curious, but investigating these drugs have me wonder if there is something else else on the horizon that works differently, as even though there are differences, most of these Wnt pathway drugs and antiandrogens are pretty similar overall. Well, as it turns out, one upcoming treatment that is on the horizon comes from a company called Replicel, who are developing various injectable cell therapy technologies for rejuvenating skin and repairing tendons as well as for hair loss. The treatment they're researching for hair loss is already fairly far along in development, as it is currently in phase 3 clinical trials, and it is called RCH01. So, looking at the Replicel website, they mention a preliminary phase 1 study of 19 subjects that was published as a poster which you can see here. The study was done to assess safety and basically show no ill effects from the injection injections, and overall 63% of the subjects after 6 months showed increased hair growth, so pretty promising so far. Although it's worth mentioning that this was obviously a very preliminary study, but it gave Replicel enough confidence to go on to sponsor a phase 2 study which enrolled a lot more subjects and looked at this RCH01 thing in more detail. So let's take a balls deep approach at this phase two study and see what the research researchers found out about it. Well, this is a recent study out of Japan from 2020 and it is titled, quote, Autologous cell-based therapy for male and female pattern hair loss using dermal sheath cup cells, a randomized placebo-controlled double-blinded dose finding clinical study, unquote. So for those who don't know what the word autologous means, it basically means the subjects were transplanted with their own cells. So anyways, this study has to do with what's called the dermal sheath cup cells. These are cells that surround the dermal papilla, which are an important part of the hair follicle. Now, these cells are a little obscure. It's hard to find a picture of them, but here is one right here. And the dermal papilla itself is at the bottom of the hair follicle, and it's the cells you see right here in the middle. The dermal papilla, as many of you guys already know, is the driving force of hair growth because it creates the cells that form the hair follicle, which in turn create the keratin, which is the protein that forms the hair. The bottom of the hair follicle is surrounded by the dermal papilla sheath cup cells, and these cells are a form of stem cells that go on to form the dermal papilla cells. So maybe these cup cells are the ultimate ancestors of all parts of the hair follicle, and if that's true, would it be possible to grow new hair if you were to inject these cells into the scalp? Well, that's the premise behind RCH01, and it is admittedly an interesting one, so let's see what the researchers found out here. So, looking at the introduction to the study, they reference a couple of earlier studies on these cup cells, one study showed that injecting these cup cells into mouse ear skin grew hair, and another transplanted either cup cells or dermal papilla cells into human skin, and in that study, hair growth was observed when the cup cells were transplanted, but not when just the plain dermal papilla cells were transplanted. So these cup cells seem even more important than dermal papilla cells, even though the dermal papilla has long been considered the most important factor for hair growth. So who knows, maybe this kind of cup is the holy grail for hair growth. So to test this, the researchers recruited men and women with male pattern and female pattern hair loss, which of course is just androgenic alopecia. All the subjects had some dermal sheath cup cells dissected out using what's called a punch biopsy, which is just something they used to suck out a tiny piece of the scalp, and this tissue was subsequently cultured. They then chose four circular areas of hair loss on each subject, and in three of those areas, cup cells were injected at three different concentrations, including low, medium, and high concentrations, so essentially the subjects were just using different concentrations of the same treatment on different locations of their scalp. The fourth area of their scalp was just injected with saline, so this was the control placebo area of the scalp. So this is a very good study design because each subject served as both a control and treatment group. 
photo trickograms were taken before the injections, and then after every three months over the course of an entire year, and hair densities and hair diameters were measured. Again, this is a very good methodology because it is, because it is very objective, unlike, say, for example, a before and after photo that can be influenced by factors like lighting, hairstyling, and angling. This clearly isn't just some patient survey-based study. The subjects were monitored for side effects too, and we'll get into that in a bit. So first, let's get to the results. They were able to recruit 67 patients, of whom 65 actually went through the study, so a pretty dedicated group of subjects overall. There were 50 men and 15 women with average age of 51 years. So how effective was the treatment? Well, the results are a little strange. As you can see in the first graph here, total hair density increased, but only with the low-dose injection of cup cells. The middle and high dose were no better than placebo, so it looks like we may be looking at something similar to the wind pathway drug SM04554, which also showed best effect at the lowest dose, although keep in mind that other wind pathway drugs like KY1932 don't seem to have that problem. Also, in all these graphs, you'll see the effect of the injections unfortunately drops off at 12 months, which doesn't make it seem like it's a very useful treatment for long-term use. Next, we are looking at what the researchers call the cumulative hair diameter, which is the sum of all the hair diameters in the scalp area divided by the area, and that too increased with only the low dose. However, that must have been just because the number of hair increased with the low dose, because if you look at the average hair diameter, there was no change with any of the treatments, not even with the low dose of cup cells, which we've already established as being more effective than either the medium or high doses of the cup cells. There was no difference in the results between men and women, however, in the older subjects, meaning those who are older than 51 years of age, the treatment was more effective, which is pretty atypical, as most hair loss treatments that we know of, like finasteride, work better when you are younger. Also, those with less severe hair loss, which they consider to be like Norwood 3 or 4, the treatment was more effective, which is more in line with conventional hair loss treatments. Some representative trichogram images are shown here, and I have to say, I do believe these trichogram numbers, but just eyeballing these images, they don't really look that different to me. I mean, maybe a little better, but nothing substantial. Regarding safety, though, there were only mild adverse effects, such as some swelling and redness and minor bleeding at the injection sites in 14 subjects. There was, there was no difference in adverse effects between the injection sites using saline versus using cup cells, so the side effects were probably just from the injection process itself. Three people did feel faint after the injections, but no one passed out, thanks goodness, so the pain is probably not as bad as, say, microneedling. So, in the discussion, the researchers state that the dermal cup cells may work by inducing antigen and hairs that are in the telogen resting phase, so you'd expect some shedding from the treatment, but they didn't mention this in the paper. It seems to work better in older people with moderate hair loss, and it worked as well in men as in women, so even if the results are not that great, at least it doesn't discriminate by gender. The researchers note that the fact that the hair diameter didn't change is good, because if the therapy just induced more vellus hairs, which are miniaturized hairs, the hair diameter would have gone down with therapy. However, the hair diameter didn't go down with the saline injections either, so I think I think the investigators are just trying to say whatever they can to rationalize this mediocre treatment. So it is curious as to why the injections only worked at the lowest dose. I mean, you'd think if some dermal sheath cup cells were good, then more of them would be even better, right? Well, they come up with some face-saving possibilities, like maybe more cells caused extra injury to the tissues by causing more inflammation, or that these extra cells just die when they're injected, or that too many cells shut off the antigen growth phase of the hair follicle, but this is all just speculation on their part. And the fact that we have a lack of a normal dose response curve, meaning the treatment is not more effective at a higher dose than a lower dose, makes me worry a little bit that the treatment may be bogus or at least hard to titrate for most patients. Clearly more studies are needed, and supposedly they are ongoing as we speak, but I think we're going to need to see better results before we could put much faith in this treatment. Also, it appears the treatment is just temporary as the benefits wear off after 12 months. I mean, maybe the injected cells just die off and you'll need booster shots every year or so to maintain the benefits, but getting scalp injections just once a year, you may think, oh, that doesn't sound too bad, but a lot of it is going to depend on how expensive this is, and being that this is a cosmetic procedure that can only be performed by a medical professional, I wouldn't count on it being covered by health insurance, and therefore it's likely to be very expensive, at least at first. So, getting back to the RepoCell site, there is a very detailed video that I'll link below that describes the RCH01 therapy, and it is exactly as described in the study. They do a punch biopsy, then extract the dermal sheath cup cells, and then inject them back in. In the video, they really overhype the treatment, and they anticipate a complete regrowth 
growth of the hair on a bald scalp, which hasn't been proven to be possible as of now, but based on the study we just reviewed, I wouldn't be that optimistic overall. So obviously this treatment is different from what we normally associate with conventional hair loss remedies like 5-AR inhibitors or anti-androgens. You know, I'd say it's somewhat similar to platelet-rich plasma injections and how the treatment is delivered. And I do have a video about PRP therapy, which I'll link below if you want to see the similarities for yourself. So despite the initial underwhelming evidence, does RCH01 from Replicel have any potential as a primary hair loss treatment? Well, unless we see something miraculous in the phase 3 trials, then I'd say hell no, not even close. I wouldn't even consider this as a viable secondary treatment, as minoxidil has much better results even when it's used by itself. At best, this may be some obscure tertiary treatment for the intellectually curious, but considering it plateaus after the 12th month and antrogenic alopecia is a long-term battle, I really think that out of all future treatments I have seen on the horizon, this one is one of the less impressive and least promising by far. Wind pathway drugs that I've reviewed like WAY316606, SM04554, and KY19382, as well as novel anti-androgens like pyrolutamide, clascoterone, and GT20029 all look far more promising than this. Normally, I wouldn't even bother covering a treatment like RCH01 because it seems so unimpressive so far, but for some reason it has still generated a lot of hype, so I figured it would be worth sharing. And to be fair, I do think Repulcell at least deserves a chance to prove themselves with the ongoing Phase 3 trials, and if they could demonstrate better outcomes while also using a strong methodology, then I will give it another look. In the meantime, though, I would just stick with the big two. If you use finasteride, you will very likely never have to worry about hair loss ever again, but on the off chance that finasteride alone is not enough, you can use minoxidil along with finasteride, and there is an even better chance you'll never lose hair again, as this is a clinically proven stack for the treatment of androgenic alopecia in both the short and the long term. It is possible we'll get something even better than the big two in the future, but I doubt it's going to be RCH01. Until then, keep fighting the good fight, my hair loss witchers. God bless America. Take care.